Our next guest is Paola Pomponi. So good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for being here rather than going for a siesta. So let's go straight to the point. How many existential psychotherapists does it take to change a light bulb? None, because the light bulb will change itself when it's ready. And how many narcissists does it take to change a light bulb? Well, just one. All they have to do is to hold it in place whilst the whole world revolves around them. And how many clinical psychologists does it take to change a light bulb? Well, only one, but sorry, there is a six months waiting list. And in the meantime, here is a leaflet on how to cope with darkness. So three light bulb jokes. Maybe some of you laughed, some stayed, maybe smiled, some stayed serious. But what is a joke? A joke is a short story, sometimes made out of just a couple of sentences. It follows a specific and well-defined structure. Its aim is to make people laugh and is usually not meant to be taken literally. A joke often takes place as a dialogue between the teller and the listener. It usually consists of an introductory framing and the narrative which sets up for the punchline at the end. Now, the punchline is the unexpected and funny conclusion of any performance, situation, or story. In any case, it is the punchline that triggers laughter. In the punchline, the humorous element of the story is revealed. This can be done using a pun, which is a form of wordplay that exploits multiple meanings of a term or of a similar sounding word. The effectiveness of a joke relies in the fact that the introduction and the narrative build a tension which should reach its highest level at the very end. Usually, jokes benefit from brevity, containing no more detail than it is needed to set the scenes for the punchline at the end. Jokes are passed along anonymously. We don't really know who invented them, but we might remember where we heard them or who told us. Jokes are also passed along in written form or graphically as cartoons and nowadays also as videos. Going back in history, there are ancient finds of jokes. The very oldest identified joke is an ancient Sumerian proverb from 1900 BC, dated to the old Babylonian period. The joke goes, a dog entered a tavern and said, I can't see anything, I will open this one. Now the punchline is not clear and therefore it doesn't make us laugh. This is a typical, typical example of the importance of cultural environment and language lost in translation. Probably it meant that the dog entered the crowded tavern with his eyes closed, being anxious at discovering what was going on and decided to open only one. Still for us, it doesn't work. The second oldest joke discovered in the West Car Papyrus was from ancient Egypt, circa 1600 BC. And it goes, how do you entertain a bored pharaoh? You sail a boatload of young women dressed only in fishing nets down the Nile and urge that pharaoh to go catch a fish. A bit better. Jokes can be notoriously difficult to translate from language to language, particularly puns which depend on the sound of specific, specific words and not just on their meanings. And each culture and language will have their own jokes and puns. Now, back to the analysis of the components that are necessary to create a joke, it is very difficult to categorize all different elements into a classification system. 
1991, the linguists Victor Ruskin and Salvatore Tardo attempted to devise a complex classification system called the General Theory of Verbal Humor, developed specifically for jokes, and later expanded to include longer types of humorous narratives. The theory suggests that humor arises from the violation of certain linguistic norms or expectations. It proposes that jokes and humorous statements often involve incongruity, ambiguity, or a play on words. Overall, it is suggested that humor is derived from the manipulation of language and the violation of linguistic norms. So now let's look at this joke. Two eggs and a rush of bacon enter a bar. The bartender says, sorry, we don't serve breakfast. The first sentence sets the scene. The second resolves the situation. The connector is the word serve. The eggs and bacon personified cannot be served because in a bar breakfast is not served, only drinks. The ambiguity is produced when a linguistic item has only one representative at one level, i.e. phonetically, but more than one representation at another level, i.e. semantically, as in the case of the verb serve. The wife says, I look fat, can you give me a compliment? Husband, darling, you have perfect eyesight. The contrast between two or more scripts within the text of a joke is a premise for its success. Sigmund Freud was one of the first to study the psychology of jokes. In his 1905 study, Jokes and Their Relation to the Unconscious, Freud describes the social nature of humor and illustrates his text with many examples of contemporary Viennese jokes. Freud examines the relationship between humor and the unconscious mind, suggesting that jokes often reveal hidden desires or forbidden thoughts. Additionally, Freud posits the origins of humor in its role of aggression and the pleasure derived from breaking societal taboos. So humor is the mind's unconscious way of diffusing tension in society to ensure its own survival. It is the mind's way to maneuver pain, insecurity, and sadness. Humor is a safe and easy way to attain this happiness on the cheap. Freud liked to make jokes about Jews, women, and matchmakers. Why have you brought me here? The prospective husband asked the matchmaker reproachfully. She's ugly and old. She squints and has bad teeth and bleary eyes. Well, you don't need to whisper, the broker interrupted. She's also deaf. Throughout history, philosophers have had many explanations for what humor actually is. Early Greeks like Plato, Aristotle, and Epictetus generally took a very negative view of it, thinking that it was a vice, mostly consisting of laughing at those that we thought were inferior to us. This was known as the scorn theory. Supposedly, Epictetus never laughed at all. Yet later philosophers like Aquinas thought that it was perhaps more of a virtue because it brought joy and a kind of play used to sharpen our wits by making connection between things. Kant also challenged the humorous corn theory, offering instead a theory that humor and laughter as a result was the mental release of energy from a buildup suddenly dissipating. He thought that the wound up nerves that were formed by the buildup of a joke were suddenly released by the punchline, resulting physically in laughter. However, like the Greeks, he thought that jokes were a rather useless activity. A thorough analysis of humor is to be found in the comprehensive study done by Rod Martin, a renowned Canadian psychologist, in his book, uh, Psychology of Humor and Integrative Approach, published in 2006. In his book, uh, Rod Martin explores the psychological aspects of humor, including its definition, theories, and its effects on individuals and society. It discusses various theories, such as the incongruity theory, superiority theory, and the relief theory, and examines the role of humor in social interactions, communication, and mental health. Let's have a quick look at these theories. Incongruity theories focus on the dissonance that every joke seems to build on, 
in order to produce funniness based on the contrast between the hearer's expectations and the surprising resolution given by the speaker. Superiority theories refer to the aggressive aspect of humor. Such jokes imply a humor that is patronizing the other for a weakness or for low social class, for ignorance, for stereotypical behavior, or so on. The comic literature aimed in a certain historical period to penalize social or human defects through humor and laughter, and most often to ridicule women seen as an inferior gender. Release theories deal with the psychological causes and effects of humor. They deal with the joke's cathartic power. Humor and laughing, sometimes seen as therapies, release cognitive and emotional tensions, abolishing inflexible laws in exactly the way that playing does through its spontaneity. Certain jokes play with words and distort them in such a way so that the catharsis could be produced. Now, for those who are interested in research, I want to mention Willie Bolt Rush, who in 2008 published a comprehensive book about research and studies conducted to understand and categorize humor and laughter from a psychological and evolutionary point of view. Psychology, Rush states, is about people, and therefore the psychology of humor is about the interaction between people and humor, not humor on its own. A psychology of humor needs to describe and explain the cognitive processes involved in the experience of humor, like the creation of a funny remark or the response to a funny joke. A psychology of humor also needs to assess whether or not we can control humor behavior and whether or not we can teach people to be funny or to enjoy funniness. Psychology has indeed been one of the disciplines that mostly contributed to the study of humor and laughter. The experience of humor is defined as the perception of something funny, although the idea of funny is a very personal and unique one. It is the experience of something incongruous and the engagement in playfulness and lightness. Humor seems to have different flavors. It can be bitter, salty, or dark, ironic, or sarcastic. It can play with words and sounds and with the absurd. Is the doctor at home? The patient asked in his bronchial whisper. No, the young, the young and pretty uh, wife whispered in reply, come right in. And this joke, the ending come right in, is incongruous as it doesn't really match the no. It doesn't make sense for the wife to invite the apparent patient in. The incongruity ends when we imagine that it must have been her lover. The words young and pretty gave us a clue, but it was too early to make sense of their presence in the story. In the end, some may experience their sympathy for the patient in need, or one's feelings towards adultery, or they might just love the sexual element or just hate it. Sexual themes are frequent in jokes, as is racism and misogynism. Humor is dependent on moods or frames of mind, being open to it or not. We respond positively to humor at certain times and less at others, depending on our own frame of mind. On the other hand, we also know that laughter is contagious. One joke might invite another and another. And often we experience a change of state from seriousness to playfulness. But without a playful disposition, a joke will seem annoying or nonsensical. With a different attitude, the same joke will be perceived as funny and amusing. We have seen earlier that one of the important characteristics of a joke is its absurd component. Absurdism is the philosophical theory that the universe is irrational and meaningless. As existential therapists, this is our bread and butter because we work with this construct and we engage with our clients in the search for meaning. Absurdism claims that life and the world as a whole are totally absurd. The basic outlook of absurdism is inspired by existential philosophy. But while existentialism tends to engage in a more optimistic attitude towards the possibility of finding or creating meaning in one's life, absurdism and nihilism share the belief that life is just simply meaningless. Absurdist humor is a form of humor based on deliberate violations of causal reasoning 
producing events and behaviors that are obviously illogical. Portrayals of surreal humor tend to involve irrational and bizarre situations, incongruity, and expression of total nonsense. Contemporary American philosopher Thomas Nagel believes that life is indeed absurd, but there is no need for despair. In fact, he believes that humor is the best way to alleviate human despair. Nagel believes that our absurd condition arises from a collision between the seriousness with which we take our lives and our capacity to step back, look at things from a wider perspective and see ourselves without presuppositions as arbitrary, idiosyncratic, highly specific occupants of the world, one of countless possible forms of life. We should recognize the absurdity not as a demand for heroism, he says, but rather as a manifestation of our most advanced and interested, interesting characteristics arising from our incredible human ability for self-transcendence. When we step back and see our strivings for what they are, highly specific and without any real universal meaning, the view from Nagel is not heroic nor hopeless, but as he puts it, sobering and comical. Life is much too important to be taken seriously. The appropriate response to a human condition is a slightly bemused, bemused smile, a celebratory laugh that we understand life's absurdity, yet we carry on regardless. Laughter is often seen as synonymous with humor. However, in psychology, we know that there can be humor without laughter and laughter without humor. The psychological study of humor includes the study of laughter. It seems that vigorous laughter exercises and relaxes muscles, improves respiration, stimulates circulations, increases the production of pain-killing endorphins, decreases the production of stress-related hormones, and enhances the immune system. If we connect humor with health, her three laughter is the crucial component. Humor and amusement without laughter doesn't seem to produce positive effects on our health. Yet laughter might be expected to have beneficial effects even without humor. So even if laughter is artificial, it seems that the person with a healthy inclination is the one who laughs as often as possible rather than the one who enjoys just dry humor accompanied only by the occasional chuckle or smile. In this model, humor interventions should be aimed particularly at encouraging people to engage in frequent and intense laughter. However, not all laughter is positive and healing. There is also what we call nervous laughter, which is the brain's way of dealing with negative emotions or events. When someone is in a tense situation, they could suddenly feel an insanely powerful urge to laugh. Nervous laughter happens for a number of reasons. Some research suggests that our body uses this sort of mechanism to regulate emotion. Other research has found that nervous laughter might be a defense against emotions that make us feel uncomfortable. So far, we have given a lot of thoughts about laughing, but there is another aspect to the expression of humor, which is smiling. A smile might give way to laughter, or it might be just a smile. There are many different kinds of smiles, as there are different blends of emotions. There are sincere smiles and phony smiles. Smiley invi oh, smiling invites connection and creates social harmony. But how do you know if someone is smiling or pretending to? Fake smiles are often asymmetrical and tend only to engage the mouth and not the eyes, whereas a genuine smile engages the entire face and is usually symmetrical. Genuine smiles use the eyes. In fact, a genuine smile engages both the muscles that contract the, control the corners of the mouth and the muscles that cause the eyes to crinkle. A forced smile, instead, only engages the mouth muscles. So by now, we can say that we have a good understanding of the broad range of direct and indirect effects of humor and laughter on people's perceptions, attitudes, judgments, and emotions, which can potentially benefit the physical and psychological state. Such is the impact of uh, humor on the human brain that the use of humor and laughter is now becoming an important part in treating people with serious mental illness. But now, 
let's move to the therapy room. In therapeutic practice, humor has been considered as an expression of nearness, positive feedback, a coping ability to mitigate and shift the way or distance oneself from negative events, and the ability to grasp paradox and therefore change. Laughing is considered essential to recover the health and constructive parts of oneself. Humor is indeed, indeed construed as a very useful tool. The humorous ability of a client can be assessed already during the first session, observing their style in self-description, noticing the lighter elements of their narration and their use, if any, if any of paradox and absurdism. This is especially important in order to build and monitor the therapeutic alliance. The relationship in therapy is unique, and the way therapist clients build intimacy and understanding are different from relationships outside of the therapy room. Although humor is present in both personal and clinical relationships, its use in therapy must be selective and only for the benefit of the client. However, just like many other therapeutic interventions, humor can have negative effects and pose some risks when its use causes humiliation or diminishes the client's self-esteem. It can have a negative impact on those clients that have suffered humiliation or intimidation or who can feel diminished or those clients with paranoid or narcissistic traits, or in cases when it's premature with respect to the therapeutic progress, alliance, and the patient's insight capacity. Existential therapy is serious business. Often serious is synonym of deep, dark, and painful. Yet therapy is also aimed at shifting and widening our client's experience of themselves and the world around them. Some therapists might experience times when laughter, absurdism, and playfulness enter the narrative in a natural or unexpected way. And when this happens, something is transformed in the therapist-client relationship. Letting your guards down and engaging in a few jokes and silly laughs with your clients may actually serve to slow the stress hormone cascade for everyone in the room. The sense of safety and acceptance might foster intimacy and trust and add to the therapeutic relationship. The space between therapist and client becomes closer. As existential therapists, we're privileged to be able to share in another's deepest, darkest, and most intimate states. But with this privilege comes an immeasurable heaviness for experiencing another's raw humanity. And by sitting with our clients in this way, we too sit with ourselves, because after all, we are completely and utterly interconnected. Laughing with, and of course not at, our clients becomes an expression of being human together. Letting laughter fill up the therapy room from time to time might be an important indication that we as helpers are we viewing ourselves with modesty rather than as the one who has to make everything better. In existential therapy, we observe our clients' struggles, uncertainties, and loss of meaning. Existence, as we know, doesn't have an inherent meaning. It is for all of us to try and find our own, what might make sense for us in our experience of life. With a phenomenological stance, we observe our clients and our own struggle to survive, to find purpose and expand possibilities. But if we stop and think rationally, how can we not see that life is mostly spent trying to keep our body alive, provide for ourselves and our family, seeking security and health, physical and mental? It's a huge effort, day after day after day. And then, in any case, we die. We are born alone and we die alone, no matter what. That's it. For sure, this very thought, as we engage with it, brings a good dose of existential anguish, and we know that it is real. Obviously, we cannot change the human condition, but what we can change is our point of view, the way we might be able to interpret its meaninglessness. As Nigel was saying, what we could do is to step out, look at ourselves from a detached observation point, and realize the oddity and absurdity of human life. We might then be able to find it so absurd that it becomes, at least for a moment, quite funny. That's when humor, in all its splendor, raise, rises from anguish and despair and expresses itself through a joke, a pun, or a silly story. 
the rest we know. Humor brings laughter, laughter brings endorphins, and so on. But in that moment, being human becomes, okay, crazy, but somehow acceptable. Laughter usually is shared, and that sharing in our therapy room creates a very strong bond. Not necessarily as therapist to client, but with humility as human to human. Laughing, laughing together at the absurdity of life creates a new experience, and in that craziness, perhaps, we are not completely alone. Humor and therapy can have other attributes. Laughter can be a defense strategy. The client might be laughing at something that is not at all funny, perhaps some deeply painful experience where laughter is totally out of place. Laughter or smiling, as we know, can be forced or faked. The client might be laughing at the therapist's humor simply to please them. The latter situation is something that we as humorous therapists must be very wary of. Making jokes that could be perceived as offensive or misplaced or simply misunderstood will certainly create a problematic situation. Making jokes for the benefit of the therapist to show how funny and lively we can be is another minefield. The client might be offended or confused. They might laugh because they see the therapist as the one who holds the power in the room, and caution needs to be used at the beginning until a relationship is established and we are aware of boundaries. We can safely guess what can or cannot be joked about. The wrong joke at the wrong time with the wrong client is a recipe for disaster. When humor appears in the therapy, but it feels somehow not quite right, the important thing to do is to address the issue, to discuss what happened and why it happened. Much will be learned from such conversation and the relationship will probably be safe. Humor is a fantastic asset for our work, but it must be used properly. We often say that existential therapy is an art. It requires many virtues, not least humility, openness, and creativity. Such virtues cannot really be taught or learned in a workbook. They come with experience. Humor and therapy is not a subject that we learn during our training, unfortunately, yet it can be so important and so beneficial that it might deserve a module of its own. Humor is a bridge. When we meet someone, we may smile and offer a hand to invite the others to connect. A handshake is often a gesture that we do without much thinking, yet that touching of two hands is a symbol of many positive elements. Connection, trust, closeness, cooperation, empathy, just to name a few. A handshake is the first bridge that connects two people. Humor is another bridge that connects and resets relationships. In a world riddled with conflict, brutality, violence, injustice, where have the bridges gone? What is it that makes the ego, personal, or political, or nationalistic, prevail against common sense and the well being of populations? We are witnessing the opposite of all that magic that we have been discussing today, yet, humor is out there everywhere, part of our lives, if we just step out of it for a moment and observe it from outside. A handshake between political leaders has the power to change or save thousands of people's lives. Why is it so difficult? And what can we do, each of us in this room, for example, to create that bridge? Perhaps nothing. Perhaps just watch the disaster with distress. Or perhaps we can operate like little ants, building tiny little bridges in our own insignificant daily, daily life in and outside the therapy room. To conclude, let me tell you this. Humor is powerful. It's everywhere, outside of us and within us. Are we going to change the world with the jokes? Oft, obviously not. Yet with a handshake, a smile, a silly story, and a laughter, we can change the small world that we belong to. If we remember that joy, playfulness, and lightness are the essential parts of a life well spent, then humor is the most important ingredient. We can use it to strengthen our relationships. We can use it to build bridges. Thank you. Thank you. Um, do you have any questions? 